Major breaking news, the Department of Justice has made a major concession in the oral argument in the United States versus Rahimi case that will be, I think, tremendously valuable for those of you who have been convicted of misdemeanors and not felonies as defined by state law could be a huge deal when it comes to federal gun control law 18 U.S.C. 922 G1, felons in possession, a big deal because of an admission and concession made by the best lawyer that the United States Department of Justice could muster and send out in the United States versus Rahimi case. Stay tuned. You're not going to believe what I uncovered in this oral argument transcript. Hey, folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of The Four Box, a diner, proud American gun, and a constitutional attorney, member of the United States Supreme Court Bar, and author of Disarmed, What the Ukraine War Teaches Americans About the Right to Keep and Bear Arms. All right, folks, this is a big deal. I've been going through the United States Supreme Court oral argument transcript in the United States versus uh, Rahimi case. And what I've been doing is laser focused on statements being made by the United States Department of Justice because they sent out the Solicitor General of the United States, one of the leading officials for the Biden administration, a Supreme Court, uh, and a position that is nominated by the President of the United States and confirmed by the United States Senate. Of all the people that Attorney General Merrick Garland decided to send out to fight against our civil rights, against our constitutional right to bear arms, this is who he sent out, which is a, a Solicitor General Elizabeth uh, Prologar. And any statement that she made to the U.S. Supreme Court is binding on the Department of Justice. And that's why I'm looking very carefully at things that she said that we could potentially use against the Department of Justice, as well as other government agencies in our fight to maintain and advance our right to keep and bear arms under the Second Amendment. And I found yet another example. Specifically, there's a discussion here, and I'll play the tape for you as I always do, between the Solicitor General and Chief Judge John Roberts, Chief Justice John Roberts. Now, this is particularly important, this colloquy, because it really shows that the U.S. Department of Justice is drawing a distinction between who can be disarmed and who cannot be disarmed. And one of the ways that she did it in this is very interesting because she basically said that in her position, the position of the Department of Justice, those people who've committed crimes that are classified as misdemeanors or minor, minor criminal conduct under state law cannot be disarmed, believe it or not, which is quite interesting because the Department of Justice and the Solicitor General was going to have to defend 18 U.S.C. 922 G1, which, as you know, G, uh, 922G is the prohibited persons list. People who are not allowed to have firearms. And G1 specifically says that if you're a felon, if you're convicted of a felony, you are not allowed to have guns. And for those of you who are geeky, you know that if you're convicted of a state misdemeanor, hear me, this is, listen carefully, if you are convicted of a state misdemeanor, where that misdemeanor statute has as part of it a potential, a potential penalty, a potential sentence of more than a more than two years in prison, that is a quote unquote felony for the purposes of 18 USC 922 G1. Which means if you're someone like Brian Range in the Range versus Garland case, and 20 years ago you pled guilty to a misdemeanor under Pennsylvania state law of failing to disclose $500 in income on a welfare application, and you plead guilty to that statute under state law, and you don't go to prison for a day, you never see the inside of a jail. But because of what you pled guilty to, because that statute, that state criminal statute that you pled guilty to, which the state declares at, to be a misdemeanor under state law, it doesn't matter because if under that statute you could have been sentenced to over two years in prison, 
even if you don't spend a day in prison, you are still defined for the purposes of federal law, specifically for the purposes of the enforcement of 18 U.S.C. 922 G1 as a felon. Nevertheless, this is a critical argument and position that the Department of Justice under Merrick Garland is taking in the Supreme Court because they're basically saying that as a matter of constitutional law, not statutory law, we know what the statute says. It says that if you've been convicted of a state misdemeanor, but you could have been sentenced to prison for more than two years, even if you don't spend a day in prison, you're a felon for the purposes of federal law, 922 G1. But as a matter of constitutional law, which is supreme over and above inconsistent statutes, which would be 922 G1, inconsistent with the supreme law of the land, which is the Constitution, which includes, of course, the Second Amendment right to keep arms. According to the Department of Justice under Joe Biden, well, guess what? You cannot disarm people that are misdemeanors who have pled guilty to misdemeanors or minor criminal conduct under state law. That's what she says. She says on page eight, and this is in response, by the way, and let me tell you why this is such a great question. Chief Justice John Roberts, this is how it all starts and how it snowballs downhill for the Department of Justice. Chief Justice John Roberts, literally almost at the beginning of the argument, says this, early question. Here's what he asks. Is someone who drives 30 miles an hour in a 25 mile an hour zone does that person qualify as law-abiding or not? Simple question. But it put the Department of Justice into an immediate bind. And you saw how she got bollocked up in a way that's favorable to us. Because she almost conceded the fact they're going to lose the nonviolent felon argument under 922 G1. Because this is what she says. And again, I will play it for you in just one second. She says, I think that wouldn't qualify to the extent that it's classified as a misdemeanor or minor criminal conduct. Right? She goes on and John Justice Roberts confirms. So are you making a misdemeanor felony distinction? And then she goes on to say, the Solicitor General of the United States for Merrick Garland and Joe Biden, that's the line that history and tradition reflect. Oh my God, again, Let's play it for you so you can hear it with your own ears, this colloquy between Chief Justice John Roberts and Solicitor General Elizabeth Prologar, the smartest attorney that the Department of Justice had, and they sent her out to the Supreme Court to take away our Second Amendment rights. Listen now. Someone who drives 30 miles an hour in a 25-mile-an-hour mile zone, does that person qualify as law-abiding or, or not? I think that that wouldn't qualify to the extent that it's classified as a misdemeanor or minor criminal conduct under state law. And I do want to be clear that we, we certainly think that wouldn't apply under the not responsible category. But if you're focusing on law abiding in particular, we think that history and tradition there support the conclusion that you can disarm those who have committed serious crimes. So it's not just that any kind of, of conduct that is an offense would qualify. Is it, are you making a misdemeanor felony distinction? That's the line that history and tradition reflect. And so, yes, I think that that is the relevant category with respect to law-abiding citizens. But again, I would just emphasize here, we're not directly invoking the law-abiding aspect of the principle because Mr. Rahimi didn't have the kind of, of, of criminal record that would justify disarmament on that basis. Instead, our arguments here are directed at the aspect of the standard focused on those who are not responsible. Well, that was pretty telling, but it gets actually more damning, believe it or not, for the Solicitor General, the Department of Justice, and Joe Biden's anti-gun administration, with a question and answer period between Justice Brett Kavanaugh and, again, General Polgar. Justice Kavanaugh says, just to be clear, one category you think the government can prohibit possession of by those who are not law-abiding uh, are those that are involved with serious offenses. And then she answers... That's correct, which we would define by felony-level punishment. But that's quite interesting, right? Because felony-level is felony-level. It seems to be not misdemeanors, which, which really I think this is the sort of thing we would use in a 922G1 case, such as the range case, if that gets granted cert. I'm sure these kind of observations will be made in the briefs to the U.S. Supreme Court to be like, hey, they've already conceded the point. Right here in the Rahimi case, Solicitor General said it. Here you go. She is a stop. 
Estoppel doctrine says she's a stop from denying she said this and from the binding nature of this on behalf against the United States government. We'll see what happens. Let's play this for you right here, right now, just so you can hear it with your own with your own two ears. Just to follow up on your colloquies with the Chief Justice and Justice Sotomayor, I just want to make sure I have the terminology exactly correct as you see it. Uh, one category, you think the government can prohibit possession by those who are not law-abiding, and you said that uh, encompasses serious offenses. Is that correct? That's correct, which we def- would define by felony-level punishment. All right, so there you have it. You heard the colloquies between Chief Justice John Roberts and the Solicitor General, and also between Justice Brett Kavanaugh and the Solicitor General. And again, it seems to me they are admitting that if you're simply a misdemeanor or a person who's been convicted of a misdemeanor crime in state law as a matter of Second Amendment constitutional law, you cannot be disarmed, which is going to be very interesting how these arguments may come back to bite them on the butt uh, when it comes to to the range case, or if not the range case, another case, although I think it will be range. We'll see what happens. Uh, Nevertheless, going to be very exciting times. I'm going to continue to look through these uh, transcripts. I'm going to continue to look at every single thing the Department of Justice says to see if we can find other ways to hoist them on their own petard and protect our right to keep them in arms because it's very important. We all know this, and I'm looking for every single way to do so. So, all right, folks. Uh, I hope you learned a little bit something here today at the Four Box of Darn. Make sure you subscribe, share this video, uh, like the video, and don't forget to follow me on X at Four Boxes Diner. And we will see you guys here at the Four Boxes Diner soon enough. Orders up. Table 2A.